Hello, and thank you for joining me for this um, talk today on the trouble with Kuween, human remains from Neolithic Orkney. My name is Rebecca Crozier, and I am an archaeologist uh, at the University of Aberdeen. So what I'm going to do today is uh, take you through one very small aspect of uh, research that I've been uh, engaged with for the last quite a few years. Um, I specialize in mortuary practices in uh, Neolithic Orkney. So looking at the Stone Age and uh, how people um, dealt with, with, uh, with the dead, essentially. So just to help situate you, if you're not too familiar with Orkney or exactly where it is, um, I can just get my laser pointer going here. Yep, okay. So we are just off the northeast coast of mainland Scotland in the beautiful archipelago of Orkney. And one of the most exciting things about Orkney, and if you, if you haven't ever managed to get there, I do strongly recommend that you go when it is safe to do so, of course, but Orkney has an incredibly rich archeological landscape. It is absolutely stunning. And everywhere you look, or in quite a few places that you look, you're almost tripping over Neolithic architecture. It's, it's really quite, quite a thing. And I suppose that's one of the things that drew me to um, doing a lot of research in this part of the world. So, as I was saying, I'm just going to focus on one small aspect of my own research, and that is uh, looking at the mortuary record. But just to flag up a few key sites, uh, what I've done is I've blown up the archipelago here so you can get a better look at it. And we're really focusing on the mainland area in here. Um, but I've just marked on some of the um, the sites that really have uh, defined Orkney and the Neolithic, I think, and um, certainly uh, led to this being a, a World Heritage site. So we have Scarabray out here on the on the west coast, um, Ring of Brodgar right next to, of course, the very famous Ness of Brodgar, um, Mayshow right next to it, just here. And then for my own research, the site that I was primarily concerned with is known as Quantiness. And Quantiness was excavated in 1972 to 1974 by uh, Colin Renfrew. And just for anyone that isn't entirely familiar, the, the sort of structures that we're talking about um, are divided into early Neolithic and late Neolithic. And generally, we're talking about a period from the mid fourth millennium to about 2000 BC. Um, and you can see here, this is what some of our uh, tomb structures might look like inside. And this is the Stones of Stennes down here. Uh, stones of Stennes being sort of in this area here as well. Okay, so my research was primarily investigating more tree practices. And this involved me looking at the human remains that came from a number of sites uh, from both the early and later Neolithic time periods. Sites I looked at, as I just mentioned, uh, Quantinus in particular, um, and this is a fantastic uh, reconstruction that was um, produced by uh, Renfrew's team uh, back in the 70s. Although you can't actually see Quantinus anymore, it's, uh, it's under a, a grass mound, but you can get an, an indication of what it might have uh, looked like if you could still walk around inside it today. Uh, I also took a look at Point of Cot. This is an early Neolithic site. Um, Point of Cot is also gone after me saying all the, the architecture is still there. Point of Cot is gone, sadly. Um, it was um, uh, a victim of coastal erosion, but this meant uh, John Barber got to excavate the entire site, um, I think in the, the late 80s, early 90s. Um, and then I also had a look at Pierwall Quarry and um, Coyness. Now Coyness is not on the mainland, it's on a different island, but architecturally and in the layout, it is almost identical to Quantiness. Although you can get a feel here of how massive it is. Um, these are megalithic sites, so megalithic big stone monuments, and they are absolutely spectacular. And this is one of the things that probably uh, draws a lot of us to be quite fascinated with, with what they are and, and what they might mean, and especially when you can see them all over the landscape. Now, for me, 
we talk about these structures as tombs. And the reason we talk about them as tombs is because, of course, they have human remains inside them. Now, not all of these structures have human remains, but a lot of them do. And it should be realized that some have more than others. So some of these tombs have literally thousands of bones, some of them a few hundred, some of them just a handful. But one of the big issues that we have is the state of recovery uh, that we come across these remains in. So this is what we might like to think about. And you'll hear um, archaeologists and, and people writing in the literature and talking in documentaries about the numbers of people that are found inside these tombs. And really, this is a this is an estimate based on what we can actually identify. But the, the issue is that we might imagine finding lovely whole skeletons where we can quite clearly see. So, for example, here, this is a, a site from Southeast Asia with these beautiful skeletons. And this is a, a female and a child. But we can quite clearly see two individuals. We can tell a lot in terms of um, age and sex and stature just from uh, their bones that we can see here. Trying to do that is not straightforward with the Orcadian uh, structures because rather than getting these lovely skeletons, we get this. And this is often described as disorder and chaos. And these two images come again from uh, Renfrew's work at Quantuness back in the 70s. And you can see this is very, very different. This is not straightforward at all. And for many years, um, archaeologists probably well, we shied away from from dealing any more with the remains because it, it's very, very challenging. It's a formidable amount of bone. So Quantinus, for example, has well over 10,000 fragments of bone. This Vister, or you might know it as Tomb of the Eagles, has many, many more. And this is a, a vast uh, assemblage to try and deal with, particularly when it doesn't look lovely like this. Very challenging indeed. But we have some new techniques now. And we are able to try and make some sense of it. And really, that is what my, my work has been concerned with. And I've just put a, another image in here for anyone, again, who, who wants to sort of visualise what these places look like. This is Wideford Hill. And you can see um, fantastic stonework here. This is actually um, approaching Wideford um, and looking out over the, over the Arcadian landscape there. So... One of the big issues for archaeologists is how do we make sense of this disorder and chaos that we're seeing inside the tombs? What does it mean? What is it telling us about what's going on here? Uh, and there are a number of interpretations that are that are circulating in the literature and, and have been circulating for quite some time. Um, and really, this is about archaeologists trying to make sense of what might appear to be the the senseless. So one of the most popular themes um, is that of excarnation. And excarnation is hauled out quite often um, and probably given a bit of a hard time now because it has been discounted um, for the, the Orcadian remains, well, for some of the Orcadian remains by um, the work that I have done and also the work of uh, David Lawrence, who looked at um, Tomb of the Eagles. So, but for anyone who's not too sure what excarnation means, this basically means exposure of the body. So um, you can see here, this is a really great reconstruction, um, but you get the idea where bodies might be laid out on a platform and exposed to the elements. It might be raised up to keep them away from um, animals. And then over time, the whole thing decays and collapses down. The idea of excarnation is that bones might be retrieved and then placed somewhere else. So we're talking about a very complex mortuary practice and something that involves different um, levels of engagement with a corpse. And a lot of this interpretation was based on the work of um, Chesterman, who has been very involved um, in the past. He was an anatomist. And, and this is before we had so many um, osteologists uh, who were uh, working in archaeology. And Chesterman looked at the fragmentation that he saw. Um, he was involved with Quantinus, he was involved with Isbister, and he's also inv involved with um, one of the, the tombs from down south as well. 
But he he suggested that this fragmentation might be due to excarnation. And he drew on some other lines of evidence. He pointed to weathering and um, potential um, burning and and developed this very complicated mortuary um, process that might have, have led to and, and explained the, the chaos that we see inside the tombs. And this is makes a lot of sense, actually. Um, and for quite some time, no one really uh, went back to examine the bones themselves. And this led to other interpretations. So we have, um, I love this one. This is um, taken from Stuart Riley's work, um, where he talks about movement of um, bodies around the landscape. Um, a number of authors talk about this, but this idea that <clears throat> bodies are being distilled. So this is really based in the early Neolithic tombs. Um, and this is based around uh, the island of Rause. So this is mid how here, which is, and this is a the reconstruction of it. So this is an Orkney Cromarty tomb. Um, it's really fantastic, very linear. But what he suggested is um, mid how is at the bottom of, of the, it was right at the sea level on Rause. And you would have had whole corpses placed in there. And then bodies get moved up the hill so moving across and up the landscape and they turn into heaps of bones and skulls so no longer identifiable as as individual corpses but but becoming more compact and then when you reach the top of the hill um so yarso is the excellent example and the body has been distilled down to just the skull as a representation almost and this is I, this is fantastic i love this because you can imagine um, people re-entering the tomb, and we know the tombs are very accessible, and engaging with a corpse, rearranging things, and then this idea of um, bodies being moved across the landscape, and in moving them across the landscape, they're transformed into something other, something more representative. And we can draw on um, concepts of liminal time and sort of uh, processes around death and 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 just a completely different way of dealing with bodies than, than we might know today. And what Riley did then, so this was all based on early Neolithic tombs, was he suggested that for the later Neolithic, and this is really the, the time period that the Quantines tomb that I really looked at is situated in, and in fact I think this, um, this is supposed to be Quantines, he suggested that this whole process that moves across the landscape was compressed into the later monuments, and so in a way, he's saying that they're no, no longer moving them around the landscape, but, but um, the, the structure of the tomb is, is, is holding the, the mortuary process within its confines. Anyway, it's complicated. Um, it's a complicated mortuary process, but it's really interesting. And I, I guess my question was, when I, when I approached all this, was can we actually go back to the, to the osteology, to the human remains themselves? And see any evidence to support any of these um, these concepts, these these interpretations that have been generated, um, because we have some new ways of looking at bones um, since since Chesterman did so back in the 70s. And so, I use something called the zonation method, which I'm not going to go into huge detail here, because that's almost another lecture in itself, but essentially involves. Um, being able to identify different, not just the bones themselves, but which part of the bone that you're looking at. And so we have basically a coding system for each bone. And this is just a sketch to give you an idea. So this is how we break up, <clears throat> excuse me, this is how we break up the, the skull or the um, cranium and mandible. Uh, this might be how we look at the, the femur. And this is all recorded and gives us a completely different picture, a much more refined picture of which bones are and are not present within the tomb. And what I was able to discern, and so this is uh, some of the data from Quantines, and this is very tiny, you're not supposed to be able to read it, I don't advise you to squint at this, it's, I can barely read it myself, but um, take it from me. What this is telling you is that every part of the human body, every bone that you find in the human body is represented at some level inside the tomb of Quantines. And this is implying that whole bodies enter the structure. So we, I believe that we have originally had bodies, 
not necessarily in this pose, but this is just to get you to think about whole skeletons again. Uh, they just don't look like whole skeletons anymore. Now, how does this work exactly? So when we're trying to figure out um, or more true processes from these very complex and challenging assemblages, we, we look at the survival patterns of particular bone elements. So if we're thinking or imagining a situation of what we might call direct burial or a whole body going into a tomb, then what we want to find is the whole skeleton represented inside the tomb. Now, if the body has been exposed or uh, through a process of excarnation, as has been suggested um, extensively for, for um, not just for Orkney, but for um, tombs of this nature with these types of assemblages, then what we're really talking about is a secondary burial process where, wherein the body has been exposed somewhere other than inside this structure. And the larger bones, so the more clearly visible bones, are retrieved later by ritual specialists, by members of the family, um, who, whoever the designated people are. They bring select portions of the body back to the tomb. If that is the case, then we would expect to see the bones that I've circled here. So the big stuff, the really recognizable stuff. So um, the skull, the arms, um, the legs, the smaller bones tend to not make it. Okay, they're they're more delicate, so they don't survive as well outside. Um, they're more likely to be chewed by animals, um, and and we're looking for a very specific. We could call it a signature. We might talk about a taphonomic signature. So we're seeing very specific um, bone representation. Conversely, if we're actually at the site where bodies are exposed and then the larger parts are taken away and we're what we would have left is all the smaller bones. So we might see a site that has uh, the small neck vertebrae, the hands and the feet. There's a bone that sits in your neck um, uh, at the front called the hyoid. Um, that's a very, very delicate bone. Uh, we would maybe expect to find that. Um, we certainly wouldn't expect to see a hyoid bone if we're looking at the middle scenario where we have a secondary burial where um, bones have been brought from somewhere else. Now, what we have at Quantiness fits our first scenario. Every bone in the body is represented. So this is a really strong argument for whole bodies being placed inside the tomb. In particular, we do have the hyoid bone. We have several, actually, um, and we have lots of um, fingers and toes, in addition to uh, the long bones and also the crania. There's a few issues around uh, how that is seen. Um, but that's, that's a whole other lecture, but it's all definitely in there. And what I've argued in my research to date is that whole bodies went in and whatever happens other things happen within the tomb, but everything happens within the confines of the tomb. So I was able to demonstrate this idea of um, whole bodies going into tombs rather than this idea of excarnation for all the sites I looked at apart from one, and that is Kuwing. Um, you can also see it um, spelt as Kuwing, Kuwing like this. So I thought it would be uh, interesting to to revisit this particular site and have a have a little bit of a look at it in more detail um, for this talk today. So Kuin is a maze how type tomb, so that means it's later Neolithic, uh, and it's located on on the mainland on a hill in the parish of Firth. It was first explored in 1888, and during that time, three or four of the side cells were explored by removing the roof and going through. It was excavated. Um, later in 1901, 1902 by Charleston. And you can see here, so this is Kuin itself, this is standing actually on top of Kuin and looking out. This is directly opposite Wideford Hill, which um, I showed you in a slide earlier. But you can see here, this is the floor plan. So there's an entrance passage that you come in, it opens into a central chamber. To get into the entrance passage, you have to crawl along on your hands and knees. Um, this is actually it here, 
uh, entering into the central chamber. And then from that central chamber, there are side cells. You have one, two, three, four. And what's really interesting about Kuin is that there is a second inner side cell of this one here on the west. So this one here is completely hidden. And it's surrounded in this, this earthen mound. You can see here in cross section, so you have this um, sort of beehive effect or chimney effect going on with the side cells and with the main chamber. But to get between, you have to you have to hunker right down. Um, I have never managed to get right into the inner one. I'm a little bit claustrophobic, which seems a bit crazy if you're a mortuary specialist. I don't like confined spaces. I did that is me inside Kuin, but um, I I can get in. I've been in here, but I can't. I can't go in there. I just can't do it. I've tried twice, but no, I haven't managed it yet. Anyway, artifacts that were originally found included a round sandstone ball, um, a broken urn that was apparently of ancient appearance. Uh, and those both came from the West cell, which is uh, this one here, which is the one with the seat added secret inner chamber. And there's also a small portion of what's referred to as a steatite to urn. And that was suggested by uh, Charleston to maybe be due to later secondary interments. Now, animal bones were also noted. And in terms of animal bones, uh, they talk about cattle bones, a small horse um, and birds. But Kuin is most famous for the remains of 24 dog skulls. And these were act this was actually... Um, uh, you may have seen uh, last year uh, an amazing facial reconstruction, but this time of one of the dogs. So I've, I've put it here because I think that's really great. Um, but this is what uh, uh, Kuin is particularly famous for, 24 dog skulls. And this has been likened to finds of sea eagles at Isvister, so Tomb of the Eagles. And I have heard Tomb of the Beagles used before, which I think is quite fun. However, Radiocarbon dating of three of the 24 dogs um, has produced dates that cluster in the middle of the third millennium BC. And so the dog skulls are now thought to represent secondary use of the tomb. So they're not thought to be um, contemporary with the human remains that, that appear in here. And this is a similar situation for Tomb of the Eagles as well. The eagle bones have also been dated, uh, radiocarbon dated, and found to be much later than the human remains deposits. But this is still interesting and it still speaks to, and a number of scholars um, have suggested this, speaks to the evolving use of these structures. And it still allows discussion around ideas of totemism for, for these particular structures. We say tomb a lot, but maybe we should say structure. Um, this is just some more images of inside Kuin to help you see what these look like. Um, absolutely spectacular stonework, you have to admit. And this is as far as I ever got, that's the way into the inner, inner sanctum, inner inner cell, if you like. OK. But in terms of human remains, what was found? So Charleston, the um, uh, original excavator, observed up to eight individuals. And this was based on the finds of skulls. However, he said three of those skulls crumbled away when touched. And I have marked the other five there just so you can see um where they were uh, charleston said they were they were positioned this um crumbling away when touched is a, is a really important note actually because it indicates the bone must have suffered some level of decay in fact the excavation reports for kuin infer greater volumes of bone within the tombs than was actually recovered so this means we have to be really careful about how we think about the numbers of people we say are actually in the tombs. You'll also, you'll hear, you'll hear archeologists, we talk about um, MNI or minimum number of individuals. And sometimes I think we get a little fixated on this number and we have to remember that that is exactly what it is. It is a minimum number that we have been able to identify. It is not the actual number that was definitely in that tomb. So we just need to be a little bit cautious about how we use it. And of course, some tombs may have held actually much greater numbers than others. But the key thing here, is this is that this decay um, that there's probably a lot more in here than, than we have to work with now. The current assemblage is composed of just seven bones. 
two femur or thigh bones and five crania. And when we say crania, we just, we're just meaning it's the skull without the jaw. There's no mandible present. Now, interestingly, none of the smaller bones of the human skeleton are present. And this precludes the support for a hypothesis of our whole body interment. And if we think back to our earlier slide for how we might use skeletal representation to talk about mortuary practices, this actually corresponds more to the profile of secondary burial following excarnation. But again, we have to be careful because of issues of bone preservation. But I'll just show you. So those are the bones that we have. We have our femur and we have our, our cranium. Um, and these two, this is two of the crania that I was able to have a look at. And there's not a huge amount. You can see this one looks quite um, uh, not in great condition. This is weathering. It's probably a bit of freeze thaw, maybe some percolating water going through the tomb has affected it. This one probably in a different place hasn't been affected in the same way. Or maybe this one was in there longer. But anyway, is there any more that the bones that we do have can tell us about what's going on at Kuwain? We're, we have to be cautious because of the, the um, issues around preservation, but it does look like there's some suggestion here that we, we don't have the same situation as we have in the other tombs where um, whole body interment is much more clear. So this is Kuwain Hill number two, and I've used the old spelling. Um, in this slide. This is um, cranium two, and you're looking at the, the superior, the top view, so you're looking at the top of the head, so the eyes would be down here, okay, and this would be the back of the head. If you put your hand on the, on the top of your head, just top back of your head, that's where that is. Clearly, there's some substantial damage to the, um, to the top here, and actually, it's particularly to the right side. If you can see this jaggedy line here. This is the sagittal suture. Okay, so this is the mid plane of the head. On closer inspection, there's at least three radiating fractures that we can identify and also an apparent attempt to stabilize. So this is not Neolithic, okay, but this is an attempt to stabilize the fractures and, and stop everything falling apart using metal staples. And this was probably done <clears throat> in the in the 50s um this isn't something that we would do do today in in museums this is um old stuff but the point is that you do have this radiating fracture here so we can have a look at a little bit more detail here so blunt force trauma at or around the time of death is identified by the presence of concentric or radiating fractures in the immediate vicinity of the defect and when I mean defect, I'm talking about this, okay. The radiating fractures and large perforation identified on this cranium would indicate perimortem, um, meaning, so that means at or around the time of death. We can't really talk about a cause of death because, because we don't have soft tissue to work with, but we talk about a manner of death. Um, we're looking at blood force trauma that resulted in a substantial penetrating injury. And in fact, you can almost see at least two blows here potentially. So that if you can make it out, there's a radiating fracture here, there's one there, there's one at the back, okay. So this is a substantial blow and this is quite exciting. Um, we don't get to see a lot of this type of thing in, um, in the Orcadian tombs because of the, the level of fragmentation that we come across. And so what's amazing about this is that this was never commented on um, in the original reports, which are extremely old now, um, but it wasn't even mentioned that there was there was any damage. It just said there was nothing remarkable about the about the crania. And this is Kewing Hill number four cranium. As if one wasn't enough, here we have another large puncture positioned on the superior or the top of the head. Um, this goes across across the midline, so the left and right sides of the of the skull. This one is slightly different to the one I just showed you because it doesn't have radiating fractures. However, 
there is some crushing on the, the outer surface, the ectocranial surface, right next to the edge of the fracture margin. And when we have a look on the interior, and so this image here is the interior um, part of the head. So I was actually, you can just turn this, this section will just turn over and you can look directly underneath. Um, we can see a small portion of the, of the vault here, okay? So this has been released, see? And this is classic um, perimortem uh, trauma. This is evidence of, you can see it here, yeah? This little, looks like a crush mark, but on the reverse side, this, is, um, this part of the, the vault has been released. This is caused by perimortem impact to the ectocranial surface, so the inside of the head that's not completely penetrated the area of the defect. So the location of this, this we would call it an incomplete bevel, would therefore imply it was at the periphery of the application of the main force responsible for this penetrating injury. So we now have two of these. So what does this really mean? Quite often, um, and what we have here, this is showing you locations that we would expect to see um, during interpersonal violence with a right-handed assailant face-to-face. -face. So facing someone, if you hit someone and you're right-handed, you're most likely going to hit the left side of their head, okay? Uh, back of the head injuries, These are this is um, taken from research that has looked at uh, where we tend to see head injuries for um, Neolithic remains in particular. So it's the repetition, repetition of the location on the top of the head. This is quite intriguing. And might this injury, let's talk about it as an injury, be administered as blows from behind to the back of the head? And if that was the case, because it's right on the top, we might think of the individual might be kneeling. Um, and blunt force trauma will create fractures around the base. So if someone is, is on their knees, um, execution style, if you want to think about it like that, um, if you imagine their head slightly forward and someone lands a blow to the back of the head, it tends to create a fracture around the base of the skull. And that's not what we're looking at um, for these individuals, although we don't have the base of the skull to check, to be fair. Um, but it's also possible, <clears throat> excuse me, for blows to be directed at the top of the head if the victim is maintaining a kneeling position. So we might imagine someone on their knees and somebody standing over them. Another possibility is that this could be some kind of post-mortem opening of the skull in order to extract a brain that's particularly grisly. Um, I think the position of the traumas that we're looking at, just to show you on that diagram, would have been in comparison up here. Um, I think the position implies the blows to these crania definitely came from above. Although it's not impossible, I think it would be difficult to imagine how this might be achieved if the person is no longer alive. On closer examination, there were no signs of any cut marks that could be interpreted as defleshing or some kind of mutilation or something that you might expect to see if this is a result of some kind of trophy taking in warfare, for example. Currently, it's impossible to decipher the specific motivation of these very significant injuries, whether they're the result of warfare, execution, or a funerary practice shortly after death is quite unclear. However, it's tentatively suggested, based on their consistent and superior position, that these injuries may have been deliberately inflicted as part of a possibly ritual execution. That's quite a big, you, it might seem uh, quite a big leap to make, but um, I, do, I do think, and if we just have a look, just going to finish up here, I'm going to leave you with uh, ritual execution, I think. The placement of these injuries, I think, is very important. And we can do a little bit more research into um, uh, that speaks to directionality. So where the person might who caused the injury might have been standing or indeed what actually has been used to inflict this type of injury. But I do think that if you have two, two crania, both with injuries in the same place, more or less, in the same tomb, 
from the same time period that this is more than um more th this is more than simply interpersonal violence or indeed warfare this speaks to something more ritualized the volume of material recognised as having sustained trauma due to interpersonal violence during the British Neolithic. So if we look at the big picture, this is actually gradually increased and it's now recognised from numerous sites. And this is again because um, there's been a lot more work going back to archive material. And there's, certain, there's so much merit in going back to the original materials once we have new techniques and, and new information at our fingertips. Of most relevance here, um, David Lawrence has also identified several incidences of healed and unhealed cranial trauma within his vista assemblage. And he's written about those as being at the side and frontal aspects. And that might be more consistent with face-to-face -face combat. But is that the case here? Again, I really do think that we're looking at something much more ritualized. And we also have to ask ourselves what this suggests about the community's perception of these individuals. We think of the tombs, let's call them tombs, in terms of collectivity and communal burial space because of the mingling of human remains and the volume of human remains that we generally speaking have. And we suggest everyone is treated the same way because of this, because, because there's no recognition, recognition of the individual. But this might not be the case. There's an indication here of differences in treatment or if you, don't, if you want to use the term of someone being singled out and special in some way, there's something that differentiates them. Or is it that the tomb is specific and that these things are happening in different, to, in different tombs and therefore even though architecturally the, the tombs are similar and, re and reflective of each other, that actually what happens once you look at the detail of it is, is different between the tombs. So uh, some of you might say in Ireland it's the same but it's different. At this stage, and just my final statement, the size of the assemblage, we just have seven bones, antiquarian disturbance, so those guys before, even before Charleston that were in taking off the roof, and the knowledge that not all the bone present in this tomb was recoverable, hinders any confident interpretation of secondary burial practices. But it certainly can't hinder the very clear evidence we have or potentially ritual um, trauma being inflicted on particular people. Certainly, more research is needed. Thanks so much for listening. Have a great day.